Next on Max TV, we take a look at the opening stage of the Super 6. We preview Adam at Galata, and we have news and notes coming up on the next round. And welcome to the next round, brought to you by Everlast. Gabriel Montoya, Steve Kim talking boxing once again. It was a big weekend. The anticipation was building, and it was the Super 6 on Showtime. A split sight doubleheader from Nottingham, England, Carl Frock with a split decision in 12 rounds over Andre Durrell. Your score is 115-112 twice for the Cobra, and one dissenting score of 114-113 for the Matrix. And in Berlin, Germany, Arthur Abraham finishes with the flourish, knocking out Jermaine Taylor in the 12th and final round. Let's go back up top. We have controversy. And Gabe, I think we both agree yet disagree. I do think Andre Durrell won the fight. However, I think it was a close, awkward, difficult fight to score. And I don't know what the controversy is. I'm seeing words like robbery, travesty, screwing. To me, the right guy won in one sense that he made the fight. He had the home canvas advantage. I'm sorry. I think this was a close fight. I think Durrell won. But I think in many respects, Durrell gave away the right to complain. Uh Yes and no. I think yeah, I think you're right that he did. He it was, aesthetically it was an ugly fight uh, for Durrell. He started out really well. Uh, I, I thought he was boxing really well, but then uh, as it became clear to him, oh, I'm fighting on somebody else's home canvas. The ref's going to be against me. The judges are probably against me. He started to complain. Started to fall to the canvas. Uh, started to, to kind of bitch and moan about every little thing. But at the same time, you know, Frotch was not effective at all, in my opinion. I had it really like eight to four. Uh, you know, nine to three initially. Uh, I just couldn't see how it was a close fight in terms of punches landed, clean, effective punches. I'm sorry, rabbit punches don't count. Headlocks don't count. And you don't get points for takedowns. You know, this is an MMA. I, I thought it was a foul fest. The ref was awful. He didn't call it equal for both sides. And he, he takes a point away from, for, uh, from Durrell late in the fight for kind of minor holding uh, at that point. It was like the least uh, egregious foul, I, I thought, uh, that Durrell committed. But then, you know, early on in the fight, uh, in the fifth round, uh, Frotch gets a headlock, pulls the guy over the ropes, roughs him up, and then gets a takedown later on in the fight, and there's no point taken. I, I thought it was the one thing that I was hoping wouldn't happen. It, it happened, is that, you know, when you go to somebody else's country, uh, the, 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 the ref is going to be so biased for that guy. Uh, and it, it's the one thing that can kind of... Uh, kind of hurt the Super 6 in a sense, is that we, we don't really clean up the sport. I mean, the whole point is to clean up a division and have the best fighting the best and put boxing's best face on. And I, I just don't think that happened here. Yeah, Andre Durrell, or as I like to call him Andre Durrell, I'm sorry, he's effective, but he's not exciting. A negative and, fighter. And I can make the point that, yes, I think the point deduction was very dubious in a sense that I don't think it was that egregious of a foul at that point. No, no, but no. I'll make the argument that I think Andre Durrell should have at least had at least three or four other points taken off perhaps even disqualified. I'm sorry. I'm not asking for a guy to stand in a phone booth and fight, but the way he was scampering off and running, he should be forced to take off the fatigue, because if I'm the U.S. military, I'm insulted by that performance. If our military acted like that back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, we'd either be German and or Russian and communist, okay? <laughs> Another thing, clinching is illegal. Yes. When referees start to finally enforce the rules, like they did for Louis Colazzo and Andre Berto, Fights will be much better. But I agree, Carl Frock's aggression was ineffective at best. But I thought it was very difficult to score this fight. I thought there were a lot of rounds. The way you interpret the round, we saw this with Gus Johnson and Al Bernstein. Mm -hmm. Two guys are sitting there ringside. They saw two completely different rounds. One guy thought Frock won it. The other guy thought Durrell won it. Here's the thing. I think Andre Durrell is a talented guy. But I think he needs to settle down. And the ironic thing is, once he started to sit down on his punches, yeah. I thought he was the better, more effective puncher, and he still retained the speed and quickness advantage. I think going into the uh, tournament here, I think Andre Drell's going to have to really kind of adjust his style a little bit. This is not amateur boxing. This is professional boxing. Yeah. And I'm not really that upset by the decision. I don't think the way Andre Drell fights should be rewarded. Did he win the fight on points? Yes, he did. But did he really deserve to win the fight? That's what I'm having a trouble grasping at no, this point. Yeah, I, I can see that. You know, uh, for me, I thought it was it was kind of a bookend performance. I thought he started out well. I thought he finished very well. Uh, it was the middle of the fight where he started to unravel mentally, and that was kind of uh, you know some insiders had told me that you know watching him train when things get hard, you know, in sparring, he has a tendency to kind of walk away or quit or complain, and that's kind of what we saw here. Him starting to unravel, but he kind of steeled himself, and and I thought it really closed the show. You know 
pretty well. I mean, there was a lot of running, but like you said, you know, when, when Frotz started to put the heat on, he, he fought back, stayed in the pocket, and, and sat down on his punches, and he was very effective doing it. There's one thing that I had a complaint with was that, you know, at the end of the fight, Frotch basically said it was okay for him to foul because he had to do something to get this guy to fight. You know, uh, I mean, there was repeated rabid punches, and besides being illegal, they're probably the most dangerous thing you can do in a fight, other than maybe like headbutting a guy or choking him out. And it was it was just kind of ridiculous for him to say, well, that's the only target I was given. You know, there's a punch called an uppercut. You know, and when a guy bends over, try that one out sometime. Yeah, or how about following a guy behind a double jab? And yeah. how about not crossing your feet, having better balance? I, I thought Carl Frock's inability to close off the ring, shut off the ring, shut off openings, anticipate where Andre Drill was going, yeah. was very, very poor. Uh, and looking ahead to Carl Frock against Mikel Kessler, uh, and I know that he, Kessler's got November 21st, I got to tell you, I don't like Kessler in that fight. I love Kessler in that fight. Yeah, I like Kessler all day. I, I would even go so far as to say he's going to get a stoppage in that fight. If, if, if he's able to put it, put it on Frotch and, and Frotch, who got hurt by Durrell you know, uh, pretty late in the fight, I, I just think Kessler's one-two, his, his straight technique, his ability to fight but also to box, um, his strength, uh, just overall skills is just way better than Frotch. If, if Durrell got exposed as being kind of green, uh, in this fight, then, then Frotch got exposed as being technically incredibly unsound. Oh, he's limited. There's no doubt about Carl Frock. He's yeah. very, very limited. Moving on in Berlin, Germany, Arthur Abraham, as expected, would catch up late to Jermaine Taylor in the final second, stopping Mr. Bad Intentions. And Gabe, I think this was kind of a prediction that everyone had. We all had it in the back of our minds that if there was one guy that was not going to finish this tournament, it was going to be Jermaine Taylor. And I have to tell you this. Not only should Jermaine Taylor, for the health and safety of his own self and his family, not only should he drop out of the Super 6, I think he should retire from boxing because he reminds me of Steve Young, Merrill Hodge, and Troy Aikman, famous football players at the end of their career, had multiple concussions, and at that point the resistance to tackles or hits lessens. And when you look at Jermaine Taylor, in about two-year span, he's been knocked out brutally, worse and worse, by Kelly Pavlik, Carl Frock, and now Arthur Abraham. And now when you hit him in a certain place or the right way, it's like you unplug something and it's over with. That's the sense I get with Jermaine Taylor. I, I get the same sense too. I mean, you know, this is kind of a thing where, you know, if we had like an, uh, a national commission or an international commission, that you would look at this and say, you know, you've been knocked out brutally, uh, in, you know, three, three times in, in, in the last two years. It's time to hang him up and, and kind of make the decision for him. It's similar, sort of the way a corner would if you were losing in a, in a fight badly. Uh, it, it was just kind of sad to see, you know. Uh, I was one of those people that said he was going to get knocked out of the tournament. I, I felt bad for him the way he landed. Uh, it was brutal. His hands kind of stiff in the air, his leg twitching. Uh, I mean, you know, granted, this is boxing, and this is what we, we come to see, and it was a spectacular knockout, one of the knockouts of the year. But at the same time, you know, you got to worry about a guy's safety and, you know, your health versus yeah. some more money. Uh, I don't think it's worth it. Yeah, and what is a concussion? It's a jarring of the brain. And it, concussions are now so synonymous with football, but it happens in boxing a lot with a guys lot. getting hit. Now, Jermaine Taylor was hospitalized over the weekend, and talking to Lou DiBella, Gabe, he is out of the hospital being looked at still, but I think they got to look at that future. But looking at Arthur Abraham, this guy is like Fort Knox. He is hard <laughs> to penetrate. And i got to tell you, yeah. uh, the one thing about Jermaine Taylor that I've never really liked is his inability to adjust on the fly. I've always yeah. called him paint by numbers in a sense. That if you program him to do a couple of things, which is to jab and to come off the right hand, he could do that. But the way Arthur Abraham, throughout a fight, kind of makes an adjustment to cover up and to slowly open up offensively, you have to adjust right along with that. Yeah. And there's one opening that Arthur Abraham gives you, and that is the five hole up the middle. The uppercut is going to be there with a little bit of the body shots. I think when Arthur Abraham starts closing the gap, what you have to do, ironically enough, is not to scamper away and jab from the outside the way Taylor was. I think you have to move inside and then find openings with those wild punches. Yeah. Because one thing about Arthur Abraham, if he catches you on the outside when he extends his arms, he has a lot of power. Let me tell you something. Physical strength, pound for pound, he's as strong as any fighter in the game today, Gabe. Yeah, he's, he's ridiculous. I mean, it, for, for him to be moving up to 160 and, and to still just have that kind of strength, you know, it, it's just it's, it's pretty amazing. I mean, and to carry his power so late with 11 seconds left in the fight, it makes him probably the most dangerous fighter in, in, the, in, the, in the tournament, even though he's the smallest out of all of them. Uh, what I like is his patience and, and his kind of, you know, just waiting. He, he knew he was going to get the knockout. He'd hurt Taylor in uh, the middle of the fight and figured if I can hurt him now, I'm going to hurt him later, and, and he did it. Uh, the thing I, I wonder about him, though, is that 
you know, I, I thought that moving up in weight, he'd be rejuvenated and he would come out the gates a little faster. But I don't think that's that's what he's going to do anymore. Well, I think that's his style is to be. He kind is of the who he is. A temperament can yeah. offset any type of physical growth or any physical change. He is who he is. He believes it's a 12 round fight. I have 36 minutes. He gives up the first 12 like he did against Taylor. Yeah. His thing is, you know, what? I still have 24 minutes. I mean, he did the same thing to Corin Gavor, yeah. who was fairly competitive early on, and at the end it was an exclamation point with a highlight reel knockout. The one thing thing about Abraham, it's hard to get clean shots on him, and I think you have to be willing to give and take, because the only thing Taylor really did effectively in the first half was jab from the outside, but he did not really create a lot of openings. When Arthur Abraham opens up, you have to punch right along with him, because it's about the only time yeah. he's going to leave you any type of vacuum. To give the, yeah, stay very compact and, and, and inside, yeah, yeah. Bring, the, bring the hooks, and especially the uppercut. But the thing I wonder, though, you know, is... From an outside perspective, if you were just watching the fight and you didn't know much about boxing, like you know some boxing judges don't, um, <laughs> you know, just well, you'd see one guy throwing a lot of punches, making the fight, and that would be Taylor, and you could almost score some rounds for him just on sheer activity. And I, I wonder, you know, Abraham was actually up on the cards when he, when he knocked Taylor out. If you put this fight in America, say like in Vegas, yeah. where they love ineffective aggression. You know, is his style going to be as effective? If he doesn't get the knockout, is he going to give up decision? I believe the judges at the time of the stoppage going into that 12th round had him up by 5, 3, and 2. Right. So obviously, Taylor was given some early rounds, and I thought Abraham pulled the way. Gabe, looking ahead, round number 2, very interesting matchup. Andre Durrell against Arthur Abraham. Let me tell you something. If Durrell is going to scamper away and scurry like Franco Harris running out of bounds <laughs> uh, against Carl Frock, I, I have a feeling Andre Durrell wants to put this fight on a football field. Uh, it's going to be interesting because Andre Durrell is being criticized by a lot of people, not only me, for not sticking around and fighting inside the pocket. Well, I have to tell you this. If I'm Andre Durrell's trainer, I tell him, don't change a damn thing. Be who you are. Don't yeah. even think about hanging around on the inside against Arthur Abraham. Yeah. I think we're going to see a very awkward fight. I think it's going to be another 12-round battle where people who actually appreciate Durrell's style they're going to say their guy got robbed again. Yeah, I mean, this is classic tortoise and the hare. And you, know, and you do not want the hare or the tortoise to catch you in this fight. I think, yeah, Darrell's going to be best served to just kind of, you know, shoe shine him all night, move around. Uh, and later in the fight, even as he slows down, I, I think he's going to have to just keep moving. You know what I find what it might be interesting? If Abraham is so frustrated by the constant moving, of Andre Durrell, what if he starts to open up? Because one thing about Durrell, he's a skilled, reflexive counterpuncher. Yeah. So even his own patience, if he does not have patience, Arthur Abraham, and starts to press the tempo, that could fall exactly into what Andre Durrell really wants to accomplish in there. Yeah, I, I think yeah, that's very possible. At the same time, I wonder what happens when Durrell you know, goes against the ropes with his hands yeah. up or, or sits there with his chin way up in the air. If he catches the uh, right like the way Frotch did, it catch, caught him moving away early in the fight, it's good night, Irene. So this is the first stage of the Super 6. Uh, it'll be completed November 21st in Oakland. Mikel Kessler takes on Andre Ward. Here's what I think. I, I think the Super 6 in Showtime, I thought the coverage was great. I thought oh, the yeah. telecast was outstanding. Love the new graphics. I think this is about as good a start based on the matchups as you could have asked for. Let's face it, from a stylistic standpoint, any fight with Andre Durrell is going to be very awkward. And Jermaine Taylor isn't always the most exciting fighter. Uh, I think the first step of the Super 6, I would say is a step in the right direction. Absolutely. It is a total success. And, you know, I've never said this before, but I, I really enjoyed Antonio Tarver. You know, I, I'm enjoying him on, on the on the. Long telecast. as he's outside the ring and not inside of it is exactly. what you're saying. Exactly, yeah. I mean, other than the Roy Jones knockout, you know, I've never been the biggest biggest fan in the world. But but as a, as a commentator, I think he's really talented. Yeah, man. and I'm I just really wondering, when he said Carl Crotch, was that a Freudian slip or something <laughs> much deeper than that? Anyway, <laughs> that's it for round number one of the next round. We come back, we take a look at Adamic Galata. And we are back. Round number two of the next round brought to you by Everlast Steve Kim, Gabriel Montoya, Talking Boxing. We go to Lodes, Poland, and indeed it is pole position. Thomas Adamek <laughs> takes on Andrew Galata in a heavyweight battle. I don't know about you, um, but I, the announcement came over the wire yesterday that the IBF championship at the cruiserweight level has been relinquished by Thomas Adamek. Uh, I think it now is safe to say Thomas Adamek is now a heavyweight. He's a former cruiserweight. I think he's looking for the big money. Yeah, uh, you know, it, it, we had asked uh, a while back about Areola you know, versus Klitschko if that was kind of a cash out. And it, it looks like Main Events is looking for somewhere to cash out with Tomas Adamek. I mean, the guy's only 32. He's the best cruiserweight in the world. I, I don't really understand this, this move that, 
you know, they were looking for somebody to, for him to have a big money fight, but that would be, you know, kind of a showcase bout. I mean, haven't they watched Latin Fury? Just go get somebody out of the Midwest. Adam McGalata, I may be crazy, and I know I'm in the minority. I don't think it's an easy fight. Not at all. I, I know this not is not all. 1997. This is not the same guy that punished Riddick Bowe for two fights and blew both those fights. But there's a huge size disparity. Uh, I think yeah. that Galata is at least two or three inches taller. And I think in terms of natural size, Galata the last five, six years has been fighting above 240. Here's a guy that's been fighting at 175, now 190, then 200. So the most he can come in effectively, I'm just guessing, here's what, 210 to 215. Yeah. Now, I think there's an issue. I do not think this is an easy fight. Not at all. I mean, the guys that have beat him, maybe they've been more technically sound than him or have just kind of blown him out like, you know, Tyson or, or Lehman Brewster. I mean, th this is not a guy that, that is a crappy fighter. You know, Andrew Galata is, is technically sound, a heavyweight as you can get. He's got power on both hands. He's got a, a pretty decent chin. I mean, it's been big punchers that have, that have gotten him out of there. Lennox Lewis is, you know, another one. Uh, I don't understand why you would make this fight with somebody like Tomasz well, Adamik, who's got a lot, of, lot left in the tank. Well, this is certainly a huge event in Poland. I'm sure. expecting a very big crowd. You've got two iconic fighters. Say what you want about Galati. He's still been very, very popular. And Adamik is one of the very best fighters in the world. What I like about this stylistically and why I think it's very dangerous for Adamik is a sense that Adamik has been troubled by movement at the smaller weights, namely a guy by the name of Chad Dawson. Well, you look at Galata. I know Galata's a bit of a front runner. He can go haywire mentally. Yeah. But Adamek only fights one way, one direction all the time. Galata's not going to need a GSP unit to find Tomas Adamek. No. I think stylistically, I think we're in for a very tough, rough physical fight. And he's the kind of guy that, that you know, he's almost like Carl Frotch. He kind of waits you out. Yeah. You know, he's a bit of a brawler. He's, he's going to kind of stalk you and, and move and... and, and you know, he's going to land maybe one or two shots, but he's going to hope that they count and kind of break you down. And Galata can stay behind that jab, yeah. work in his right hand, and he's, you know, very straight down the pipe. Like you said, he's not going to be having trouble finding him. It's just a tough fight, And man. historically, the name that comes to my mind, Bob Foster. Perhaps one of the most devastating light heavyweights of all time. He could punch, he could bang, and he had good size. He was about 6'3 and a half. But every time he went up to heavyweight, and this is before heavyweights started hitting 230, 240, 250, he was completely ineffective. We really don't know much about Thomas Adamek, and he has a good chin facing smaller men. Now you're going to get hit by a guy at 250 that could bang a little bit. I think there's an element of danger. <laughs> I was actually yeah. very surprised when this fight was consummated. Yeah, I mean, you know, granted now, galata has been on the shelf since uh, he lost a, a technical decision in the first round and back in 2008. So there's going to be a rust factor. But at the same time, you know, heavyweights, you know, they kind of, uh, they, they, they last longer on the shelf in a sense. And he hasn't been fighting all that often. He's got some miles, but he's also got some layoffs. So he might be actually rejuvenated and kind of healthy. And I go back to the style. Rust will matter if you're facing a guy with a lot of movement, a lot of snickness, an Andre Durrell type. Guess right. what with Adamek? I think he's going to make it very easy to knock off that rust because he's going to be right in the pocket It's with almost you. the kind of style that you would get if you were just trying to shake the rust off. Yeah, right. exactly. You know, I, I, I'm not... I'm not going to go with the upset yeah, special. Neither am I. I, I I'm but I'm looking at the menu saying, God, you know what? <laughs> this kind of looks good, though, for this yeah. price. I, I got to tell you, it's, it's not the fight I would have chosen no. if I'm Thomas Adamek. No. All right, I'm going to say it. I'm going I'm to oh, go wow. Andrew Galata. Oh, no. Oh, no. I'm going to go Andrew Galata late. Wow. You yeah. are bold, my friend. Yeah, I'm going to do it. Why not? That, that is bold. I'm going to say it's a tougher fight. I think Adamek finds a way to win or... Galata finds a way to lose. That may be the more appropriate <laughs> way. Well, that's it for round number two. The next round, we come back. We wrap it up with news and notes. And we wrap it up with news and notes on the next round brought to you by Everlast. We go to the fight review Saturday night in Corpus Christi, Texas. Brandon Rios, TKO and 7 over Manuel Perez. Folks, we'd love to tell you about how good Brandon Rios looked and what an exciting <laughs> fight it was on TV Azteca. Here's a problem. Despite what it said on the local listings, it wasn't shown. I saw a nice soccer game. I got to tell you, uh, T Top Rank made a lot of promises about what a great series this was. This will be better than Tele Futura. This is going to be great. It stunk. It is absolutely stunk. It's been a bust of Ryan Leaf, Jamarcus Russell proportions. Yeah. They don't know when the fights are on. They're never on time. The production is horrible. TV Azteca is bust. Never has Telefutura been missed so badly by the masses. Oh, seriously. You know, if I, you know, I want to watch a, a, guy, a bunch of guys running around, I'll put the Andre Durrell fight back. Right? Whoa, wow, I mean, you went there. I did. Yeah, it, it's just been, you know, we, were, we had the solo box sale, you know, died off, and, and everybody was really bummed about it, and we, we were sad to see it go, and we were all excited about this series, and, and they've just really dropped the ball. I, I don't understand why. Yeah, not only is the series on once every three months, 
It's not even on when it's supposed to be on. Yeah. And I, from what I was told by some of the top rank, they've taped the fight. They'll show it later. You know what, folks? Good luck actually finding it because the marketing and the execution of this series has been absolutely horrendous. Moving on to the fight preview, Thursday night at the Tachi Palace, Edison Miranda and Mal, uh, Manuel Quezada co-headline a show. Friday on Showbox, Freddie Hernandez and Damian Frias in the main event. Leading off this broadcast, Victor Fonseca takes on Al Seeger. Then Friday night, heavyweight crossroads, Oliver McCall takes on Lance Whitaker. Then Saturday in Puerto Rico, Kermit Citron stays busy against Juliano Ramos. Going back up top, uh, you hit the gym a couple of days ago, Joe Goosen's 10 Goose Gym in Van Nuys. Yeah. I, hold on, tell me this again. You saw Edison Miranda spar Manuel Quezada, yeah. who's a heavyweight. Yeah. Are you sure about that? Yeah, it was, it was, it was kind, of, kind of cool, you know, because I, I showed up and I heard that Miranda wasn't going to spar until the next day, uh, and Quezada was waiting around for a sparring partner who never showed. So Edison, you know, being the, the kind of warrior that he is, said, fine, give me my gear, let's go. And so I got to see, you know, a guy who's almost near weight, you know, he's around 172 at the time, take on a heavyweight. Uh, and you know what? He he looked really good. Uh, uh, you know, it wasn't a complete makeover. I, I, there's still some rough edges with Miranda, but he he stayed uh, behind the jab. Sometimes he even doubled and tripled it. Um, his his head movement was there, and he more than anything, I, I think he looked more fluid than I've seen him in a long time. Joe Goosen thinks this has upside. When yeah. I was at the Areola Media Day uh, about a month and a half ago, he said, "Steve, I'm telling you, I'm going to make a run." And I said, "Really?" This guy, and he said, "Yes," because he's discovered one thing. And he said, "The left hand." Yeah. He's going to make him a more educated fighter from the front side as an orthodox boxer. So he we'll see where that goes. He even worked in like the hook. Yeah, I mean, an article will be, uh, my interview with him will be out this week in, in a full detail of the sparring session. But yeah, I was impressed. Uh, speaking of uh, heavyweights and stuff, I gotta tell you, I'm kind of crazy, but Oliver McCall, Lance Whitaker, it's kind of exciting to me. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> Oliver McCall, in the words of, uh, to paraphrase one, Martin Lawrence, crazy, deranged. He's one of these guys, he's a heavy handed guy. He never runs from a fight. Lance Whitaker's still a big, serviceable body. Honestly, Oliver McCall, Lance Whitaker, you wouldn't have to really do that much cajoling for me to at least sit in front of a TV and watch these two guys duke it out. Yeah, you know, yeah, you just say, you know, you got some beer. Come on over, there's a fight. You know, I, I'm down with this one, you know, and I'm going to go with McCall in this because, you know, in, in his prime, he was a good fighter, and in his prime, Lance Whitaker w really wasn't. So, you know, I'm yeah. going to stick with him. I mean, they're both pretty old. One's 44, I think one's 37. Uh, but, yeah, I think there's, there's going to be a lot of punches thrown and, and a lot of punches landed. I think Oliver McCall is a more natural puncher. I think he's got a better chin. I think he's tougher. I agree. Kermit Cintron, Juliano Ramos. I, you know what? I give Cintron credit. Um, and this is the way the state of the business is. If there's not an HBO day, most of the times, a guy like him coming off a big HBO victory like he did against Angulo yeah. will not fight. Guess what, folks? I know it's Puerto Rico, and there's a lot of things to do in Puerto Rico. I like the fact he's at least staying busy and having one more fight in 2009. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, granted, it's kind of a, a showcase opponent. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Ramos lost to Mike Jones uh, back in August. Uh, but, yeah, that's, that's great. I mean, you know, a lot of guys will sit there and they'll, they'll bitch and they'll moan and complain and, and blame the networks and everybody around them. But, you know, Kermit is, is a blue-collar guy, and he wants to fight. And so he took this fight. Good for uh, him. Moving on here, wrapping up with some tidbits, a couple of news and notes here. December 11th, Winky Wright takes on Grady Brewer on the island of Puerto Rico. And then November 28th, Johnny Molina takes on Martin Onario on Showbox. Winky Wright, Grady Brewer. I have to tell you, Fred, for one of these kind of tune-up, stay-busy fights, if I'm Winky Wright, I would not have chosen Grady Brewer. Wild, awkward guy who can bang a little bit. Yeah, well, you know, in the last few years, you know, Winky Wright making bad business choices, you know. It's like it's, us breathing. Yeah, it's, it's kind of part of the course. Uh, yeah, this is a tough style matchup, man. You know, Grady Brewer is a, a tall guy. He's a hard puncher. You know, I mean, the, the KO ratio isn't the highest. But if he lands on your chin, man, it could be some problem. And this is a story you actually broke on your Twitter account. we got to reference this before someone else gets credit. But Johnny Molina will take on Martin Onario. I like this fight. There's one thing about Onario. I think it's the appropriate guy. Yeah. Style-wise, size-wise, toughness-wise. Uh, and I like the fact that Molina's a grinder on the inside, has some margarito s tendencies. I like this fight. I really do. Yeah, I think it's going to be all action. I mean, I think most fights with John Molina Jr. are going to be all action. You know, he's, he's a guy that's, that's really, um, you know, the last few articles I've done on him, he's, he's discovered the, the joys of infighting. You know, he was always kind of a, a rangy guy. Um, you know, he's big for, big for the weight class, about 5'9", 5'10", uh, for, for lightweight. Um, but now, you know, working under Joe Goose in uh, the last year, They've, they've got him on the inside, and he's really fallen in love with being That's that kind of fighter. That's where he should be, because on the outside, I think he gets exposed a little bit. Yeah. But I think on the inside, despite his body frame, he's like a Rafael Ruelas or a Margarito. He actually finds shelter. Heavy-handed, strong kid. I don't think people understand how raw he really is. Yeah. Uh, I think Joe Goosen really is the perfect trainer 
in a lot of respects. Folks, I know the last couple of weeks we've talked about this. The main event is back. Uh, it'll be Wednesday at 6 p.m. And this week's guest, believe it or not, are Al Bernstein. I'm going to ask him about his exchange with, uh, <laughs> with Gus Johnson. That was almost like Jim Moore saying, playoff, playoff. And then we also have Teddy Atlas, the one and only. So that is the main event this week. It'll also be archived, get podcasts and all that other stuff. So if you want to subject yourself to more Steve Kim, there you have it right there on the main event. Well, that's it for this week's edition of TNR. On behalf of Gabriel Montoya and the rest of Max Boxing, till the next round, goodbye, everybody.